Actually, I think Victor pretty much covered it, so I'll just leave you all with a nice break in between time. So the funny thing about me and journalism is that I actually got into journalism just as the industry, as we knew it, was starting to come apart at the seams, which I see as sort of a pattern in my life. Right about the time that I think something's cool and I should go ahead and do it, everybody else is like, done, we're walking away from that. So um, the closest thing I ever did to mainstream media, as, we, as those critics of it like to call it, was I was the editor of my college paper, a job I took before they told me that it ruined the GPA of anybody who had ever held it. And then I went up to Austin and I started a radio show up there um, at a co-op radio station, community-owned radio station called KOOP, and it was called The Radical Mother's Voice. So that's also probably about as far from mainstream media as you can get. It was run by all single moms. And then I came back to San Antonio and tried to start a very short-lived culture magazine before finally in desperation in need of a paycheck, I took my resume to the San Antonio Current, the alt-weekly paper there. So um, I started my career at The Current really just as the whole blogging revolution was getting underway, as the internet was really ramping up. And so by the time I became the editor of that paper in 2006, I was shocked and dismayed to find that we were sort of the target of a lot of what was basically anger and vitriol and upset out in this growing new blogosphere about what the media's shortcomings were. I was like, wait a minute, I haven't even gotten to be part of the power. Could I be part of the power, of elite, power elite first and then you guys could tear me down? But at the same time, because I was in the position I was in, because I was finally in a position of management and not just in a position of reporting, it was also clear to me that a lot of that critique that was out there, a lot of things that bloggers were saying, that other media critics were now being able to say to a very wide audience and to us directly or about us directly where we could read it, was very much true. The industry had already been in the decline of its own making. So to the extent that the internet did very much help kind of bring on the demise of mainstream media as we knew it, we were already doing it to ourselves. You can look at things like infotainment, which we invented. You can look at things like pay to play, which we invented, which I should probably say as an aside was not happening at The Current or happening at The Express News, but does happen out there, those types of things. Um, weapons of mass destruction, Judith Miller, that sort of the sense that there was something called access journalism, which is where you kind of get too close to your sources, you trade on the relationship, you sort of promise in a way a certain type of coverage or a certain timing of coverage in order to get it first or to have the exclusive on it. All those types of things were already undermining what we think of as that great institution that was supposed to be so important to the Republic that Thomas Jefferson would put it ahead of many other institutions. So, um, but the internet helped us kind of pull back the cover on all that and see that it was happening and see what was going on with it. And I think that that has been very healthy. But it also helped us realize some other things. It helped us realize that we, in fact, did not know how to value journalism. I think, um, it's indicative that we always used to call it the press, right? The press. And the press had the power, and the press could do these incredible things. The press could bring down a corrupt president. And we thought of it that way, like this physical object, right? There are these great big machines. Usually if there's a journalism movie, they have these great big machines running, and they show you the papers rolling through the presses, and it's really awesome and sexy and powerful, or they show you the headlines. And all of a sudden, when that thing went away, I think a lot of us maybe subconsciously thought, that was the value in it, right? That physical thing. And now anybody could do it. It's just a thing that we do. We get down, we think about something, maybe we make a couple of phone calls, and boom, we've got a story, we've got an opinion that has some weight behind it, and we need to get it out there and have a conversation with the public about it. And for the most part, that too has been very healthy, I think. But at the same time, we've sort of lost sight of what some of the things journalists do are that, that are in fact unique and valuable. And even though they're done with new technology now, even though technology can change the way that we do some of those things and change the way that we share some of those things, that there's some really fundamental basic skills that go into that. I'm gonna call it a vocation. It really is a vocation, a trade. We've gone ahead and added uh, master's degrees to it. We've added PhDs to it, but I think it's something that you really learn down in the trenches, the thing itself. And I guess the best way I can distill the most valuable thing about journalism is this in our digital age. It's that opinions are cheap and facts are expensive. So there's, one, there's, a great, there's a great phrase out there, right? It's information wants to be free. And there's sort of this notion that involved in that, that information is just sitting out there, right? And it's ours because it's information. A lot of times it's information about our government. It's information about what, what a company is doing in our community and therefore we have a right to it and we ought to just be able to get it. It ought to be ours and there oughtn't to be any sort of barrier between us and that information. But the fact of the matter is information is actually a collective activity. Uh, a conversation about Wikipedia happened here yesterday when we were kind of, uh, we were rehearsing. We're actually doing a little run through for this thing. And um, somebody was talking about, you know, training students that if they go ahead and look at Wikipedia, that that's just a starting place. 
which I completely agree with. But the really interesting thing about Wikipedia is that we get to watch history and knowledge being created in real time, because those things really are an accretion of facts and analysis that we all agree on together over time. In Wikipedia, you get to watch that happening. Journalists do it all the time, every day, on individual stories. So basically, you go out, maybe you get a tip. Someone calls you and says, you know, hey, I think that, I'm going to use a story that we just did, as a matter of fact. Hey, I think that the uh, recently resigned editor of the Daily Paper bought a house from, bought a house maybe from HEB, from the largest uh, grocery chain here in Texas and also one of the major advertisers for the paper. So maybe you guys should look into that. So great, that sounds really good. I'd love to blog that right away because that is hot. You know, that's kind of interesting because we had done a story earlier in the year about how that same editor had maybe killed a critical story about HEB, a critical column of HEB. So, but that's not a story yet, right? So that's just a rumor. That's possibly even maybe a public figure, so not necessarily liable, but it's possibly libelous kind of information if we don't, if we don't check it out. So then follows a whole series of phone calls, then follows a whole series of conversations with people and looking up documents online. Where is that piece of property? Who owns it? When did it change hands? Um, who's the actual president of uh, the company that owns it? That type of thing. And all of that gets distilled and put into what is actually a story that you can basically take to the bank, that you can repeat at parties and everyone will be like, that guy knows what he's talking about. Not uh, another great rumor from Jack. So, um, right? But I don't think that you see that. I don't think you see that the value of that work in the same way now that there is not that physical thing involved with it. And the other sort of mysterious, hard to value thing that happens uh, in journalism is the source. And I just kind of referred to that a moment ago. Journalists work with people, and we call them sources. They're folks who give us tips. And sometimes those are on the record sources. It will say in the paper that Jane Doe, you know, said such and such. But a lot of times, the information that we get, that we work with, that we turn into stories, comes from anonymous sources. And a lot of times, uh, sort of historians of journalism look back at Watergate, right? Everybody here knows who Deep Throat was, sort of the most famous, off-the-record, secret source uh, in American history anyways, and someone who helped bring down uh, that corrupt president that I alluded to earlier. But in general, that kind of relationship is, in fact, can be a dangerous relationship if you are not an experienced journalist, you know? It takes time to know whether someone is just trying to manipulate you, because they do do that all the time. They'll call you, they'll try to plant a story. Maybe they've got um, a political goal that they want to achieve. Maybe they've got a business deal they want to influence. So what's a great way to do that? Still in the press. You still hear that all the time. I was at a meeting of some lawyers recently, some ad litem lawyers, good people doing good work. They're the sort of folks who take cases um, for families and children who cannot afford an attorney, and they go represent them in the court. And recently, the courts, by the way, totally adjusted their fees down. So these people who were not making any money to begin with are not making really any money now. So they were having a big meeting at Luby's. They were very angry about it. And finally, somebody says, well, you know what we need to do? We've got to tell the paper, and we've got to get it out in the paper. And so People think that way. They still think the media is a way that I can tell my story. And sources will do that. They'll call you and they'll say, but you know, I really can't be on the record about that. And there's lots of legitimate reasons for that, right? I mean, our society, we like, we like to laud whistleblowers in books and we like to make nice movies about them, but oftentimes the fate of a whistleblower in real life is not so great. They lose their job. It can be hard to find another job. Maybe they never get to work in the same industry again. People, even though on the one hand they think, oh, that was so great that you blew the whistle over there, maybe they think, but what if you blew the whistle on me? So there are a lot of legitimate reasons why someone might want to remain an anonymous source, but it takes experienced journalists to know how far a source can be trusted, when they can be trusted, and most importantly, how else you go back up that information. We have some really great entertaining blogs in town that I love. I love to read them. But one of the things they'll do is they'll be like, well, an anonymous source told me X. Well, I have no idea if there's anything else to that story, if it's just somebody who had an ax grind or something to say. So, those are a couple of the reasons that journalism, even though it's now being practiced in a very different way, is still fundamentally the same craft and still requires people who are experienced and know what they're doing at it. But there's another reason that we have trouble valuing that, I think, and it is because the benefits of journalism accrue to the aggregate, not so much necessarily to the individual. It's a little bit like trial lawyers sometimes, right? Like in general, sometimes we think, ah, oh, God, I don't really like what they do. They dig up a lot of dirt, but then suddenly you need you need them. Something bad is happening in your community. Somebody wants to put a brewery on parkland that was donated to be parkland, and you think that's a bad idea, and who is going to go ahead and raise the hue and cry about that? So suddenly the press seems important to you. But in general, it really is a value that goes to the whole of society, and we, especially now, do not necessarily know how to value that. It's like, what does it do for me personally? 
And I think that that has been sort of one of the most interesting things about the growth of media on the web. We are the I generation, like the small I before whatever device, the iPad, the iPhone, I have all of them. But you think about it, it's, it's me, it's my. Even our daily newspaper, the website is mysa.com. Not our essay, not your essay, not everybody has to be in this thing together. It really matters where that streetcar route goes. It really matters whether Boeing comes to town with those jobs. It really matters if Kelly Air Force Base is in fact contaminated or not. It's my essay. So it's what I want to know about my city. It's sort of the opinions and ideas that I want reflected back at me. So I think all of those things together add up to some tremendous potential. Like, for instance, the, I think the line between what a citizen is and what a journalist is is closer than ever before. Journalists have been pushed by all of these pressures to be out in front of people in a way that we never were before. We were sort of like, we were kind of the dark arts, right? We kind of sat back. Journalists are often introverts. I'm actually an introvert. And um, we don't necessarily like that kind of exposure. We like to write about things. We don't want to be written about ourselves. But because of this new media, if you want to be sort of successful, if you want to kind of have a career in media, you have to be sort of a personality. So you're much more available. I think you're much more out there as a person in your community. And that is good. And I don't think we even take enough advantage of that as we could. I would love for somebody to email me sometime and be like, OK, so you know, I read this story that you did about the streetcar. I still don't, I still don't agree with your point. I don't think that the mayor made a political decision to take that east-west route and make it a north-south route. So tell me more about your thought process on that. Or hey, isn't it true that you had that you had dinner with the mayor's political advisor the other day? Like, how close are you guys anyways? Those are the kind of conversations that I think we could be having more, not in a combative way even so much, but like I understand you live in my community and you do this job and I want to know more about how you do your job. And so I think there is a tremendous opportunity there. And then I think those of us who think of ourselves sometimes as citizen journalists could take their job a little bit further as well. It's not enough. It's not enough to sit back and write about a topic one time. It's not enough to go to a meeting and say, gosh, why is Lila Cockrell, who's on the bond committee, why is she stumping to have that, um, to have Sunken Gardens be on the bond program? I don't feel really comfortable about that because she's the head of the Parks Foundation and that's, you know, who's in charge of the Sunken Garden thing but actually follow that up with real committed involvement in the community. You know, we had an election this past spring, and there was a ton of media coverage of that election. Um, it, was, it was almost everywhere. I mean, I don't watch a lot of primetime television, so maybe it wasn't on there so much, but almost every other media outlet that I knew of was doing some sort of coverage of it, right? And so you start to feel like, oh my God, I live in a really engaged city, this is happening. And then the polls happen, and the returns come back at 7%, which means 93% of the people didn't show up that day. On a Saturday, it's a Saturday you have all day, the polls are open until 7 p.m., they have polls all over town, so you don't even have to go very far, you just drive over and you go to the polls. And so to me, it's like, how do we, as citizen journalists, if we say, I'm gonna be a citizen journalist, how do you close that gap and say, I'm gonna be so engaged that I actually increase the engagement in my community? And then on top of that, how do I work with a full-time journalist who I now have this direct conversation with through the internet to make those sorts of relationships happen? Because if that's not happening, I think all of us are just having a really nice time with our egos online. You know, it's a lot, a lot of fun, it's a lot of entertaining, but it's not actually making society a better place, which was supposed to be our job in the first place. So what I think all of these things add up to, in addition to tremendous opportunity, is also one tremendous danger. It is really fun to be part of a revolution. And part of the reason it's fun to be part of a revolution is that we get to tear down old things that are no longer useful, that are no longer good. And that is exciting. And it is, frankly, a lot easier to tear down stuff than build it. But, um, but the danger is always that maybe we tear down some of the things that are good, as well as some of the things that are tired and old and bad and need to go. Um, I think a lot of times the way we imagine America, and we say what's great about America, we say the will of the individual, individual freedom. And our I generation reinforces that idea that it is about us. But I think that really it is our institutions that make us great. The, our institutions protect us at our best preserve us at our best, and they protect us from ourselves at our worst. And journalism at its best is one of those institutions. And I see a great movement afoot now that we have sort of broken down kind of the old walls of mainstream media to recreate that. Just this year, uh, two different associations for local independent online news sources formed. And that should be great news to everybody out there because what it says is associations mean we want to be professional, we want to hold each other accountable, we want to have standards that we all live up to. So, I guess what I would like to say in closing to y'all is, this is a project that we have to work on together. Journalism is to a great degree a reflection of our citizenry. If our citizenry is not in good shape and participatory, our journalism will not be in good shape and will not be participatory. 
it can be discouraging. I think sometimes some of the ambivalence and anger that we see reflected online, some of that vitriol that is directed at politicians and is directed at journalism is really anger at ourselves. Because our country, for all of its many great ideals, for many, our many great aspirations, we so often fall short. And it is discouraging and it is overwhelming. And you think, what can I do? I don't know what to do, but you know what I can do? I can be angry online. That's easy. Get it out of my system for a little bit and then I'll go back out and go shopping or go to the gym or whatever it is I'm gonna do. And so that happens to me too, right? Because I'm an idealist, because I believe that this is a great country and it can be a greater country. So I'm gonna leave you with some words that I often think about when I am in that place by a Polish poet who came to this country as an exile, like so many of our immigrants that have made this country the place that it is, did. He wrote it in 1969 in Berkeley, and this is just an excerpt, so um, I hope he'll forgive me if I'm doing it wrong at all. But um, it was ill at ease in the tyranny, ill at ease in the republic. In one, I longed for an end to oppression. In the other, I longed for the end of corruption. But I learned at last to say, this is my home in a great republic moderately corrupt. <laughs>